Assalamu alaikum wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. Hope you're doing fantastic. So we're continuing our reading of Thomas Hobbes' Leviathan. And it's written in a different type of spelling in English. It's kind of more classical, which adds to our skill set if you buy an older version of the text. So he's a very unique philosopher, writer. The Leviathan is really thick. And I really enjoy it because... It's so dense that it really makes your brain feel like it upgrades after you get done reading it. And so I hope you enjoy it as well. Let us continue. To this war of every man against every man, this also is consequent that nothing can be unjust. The notion of right and wrong, justice and injustice have there no place. Where there is no common power, there is no law. Where no law, no injustice. Look at that. Common power. And so if you don't have common power, there's no law. So this sounds very interesting. It sounds like you don't have a federal head, a sovereign head that lays the law of the land down. Well, what is permissible is going to cause some problems. Now, we as Muslims obviously would look to... The Sharia. But what he's getting at here is the state of not having a sovereign, right? A unified sovereign that holds the masses like, hey, it's going down. Force and fraud are in war the two cardinal virtues. So force and fraud. Force and fraud. So what is he saying here? If you don't have a common power, there will be no law. And if you don't have law, you can't have as much um, order. People will resort to more force and fraud. And that will be their cardinal form of virtues. Justice and injustice are none of the faculties, neither of the body nor mind. If they were, they might be in a man that were alone in the world, as well as his senses and passions. There are qualities that relate to men in society, not in solitude. Ooh. No, whoa. Okay. So justice and injustice are qualities that exist when you're in a society. Well, because if you're alone, you know, you don't really have the opportunity to look at justice and injustice as much. But when you're in society and you see wrongs and what's happened and you want a sense of justice to happen because it's a form of retribution, a form of atonement even and redemption. It is consequent also to the same condition that there be no propriety, no dominion, no mind and thine distinct, but only that to be every man's that he, he can get and for so long as he can keep it now that's interesting that is very interesting so no property no dominion like this is my territory this is mine i i own this miss and there's no mine or yours but it's what every person can get for as long as you can keep it he has a good point here. He's really laying it down when it comes to political organization, right? Law and order and, and what happens in a primal state where it's every man for every man's self and there's a war against everyone. When order has broken down. And thus match for the ill condition which man by mere nature is actually placed in though with a possibility to come out of it, consisting partly in the passions, partly in his reason. Okay, so the passions, let's get into the passions. The passions that incline men to peace are fear and death. Now, here we go. This is fascinating. So, fear and death. So, how would fear put you to peace? Well, imagine you're trying to negotiate and 
You know your enemy. They don't want peace. They're going to torch your cornfield. Let's say cornfield. And that is a necessary commodity for your subsistence lifestyle. And to regrow it would cause huge problems. And you'd be short and you don't have enough in storage to get you through nor do you have enough coin to purchase it from an outside source so the fear of an economic collapse in your area can push you to sue for peace or it could also be you know too many men will perish not enough women who are able-bodied to pick up the farming slack right and this will cause too many widows too many women who are not accustomed to harsh working conditions uh, to ne neglect their children and it's going to cause some disarray, right? So dysfunctionality within their society can make you sue for peace. Death definitely can make you want peace if you love life and you're not a kamikaze pilot, right? Desire of such things are necessary to commodious living and a hope by their industry to obtain them. And reason suggesteth convenient articles of peace upon which men may be drawn to agreement. So articles of peace which men may be drawn to agreement. So you have these sort of articles and they can bring people in. These articles are they which otherwise are called the laws of nature. So articles of peace are also called the laws of nature whereof I shall speak more particularly in the two following chapters. So we have laws of nature, articles of peace. Okay. Now we're in chapter 14 of the first and second natural laws and of contracts. The right of nature, which writers commonly call jus natural, is the liberty each man hath. So the right of nature is the liberty each man has. To use his power as he will himself for the preservation of his own nature, that is to say, of his own life and consequently of doing anything, which in his own judgment and reason he shall conceive to be the aptest means there are two. Okay, so arguing that the right of nature is the liberty that we possess to govern our own lives. We want to go here, we want to go there, so far. But he says to his own judgment. So what I look at here is, as a Muslim I would say, we would try to stick within the boundaries of the Sharia, but sticking within the boundaries of Sharia, you still can use your judgment to decide what's going to be, you know, best way for you to preserve yourself in a halal way that we have a right so someone can't force someone to take an occupation they do not want you have a right to choose your job that is halal you have a right to design your house how you want you have a right to grow what you want that's halal, right just having your your borders to which you can judge but having the liberty to choose that not having an overlord force you to you must do this job. You must go here. It's like, no, I have my boundaries and I will navigate the maze how I need. Let's see how he defines other things. By liberty is understood according to the proper signification of the word, the absence of external impediments. Okay, this is... Uh, so liberty is the absence of external impediments. Okay, perfect which impediments may oft take away part of a man's power to do what he would, but cannot hinder him from using the power left him, according as his judgment and reason shall dictate to him. He's such a good writer. So liberty, in his definition, is that people not getting in the way externally of what you want to do, not hindering you from the power that you have to govern yourself by your own judgment, okay? Uh, America, he's English, right? But 
the English conception of liberty and the American conception of liberty is quite similar yet different distinctions. But when I think of liberty here in America, uh, we saw the government practice restricting our liberties during the lockdowns over Kofi. They took away our jobs and demanded we still pay our bills. So they took away our liberty to earn and the, and the guys to see if we would accept it, I'd argue, right, for a medical emergency. But they built no new hospitals. No one saw the military uh, sent out. So people were plunged into debt. Our way of life was restricted. We didn't have liberty to even say we don't want to wear a mask. Well, those people who chose not to wear it, right? But someone would refuse you service, right? They would not service you if you didn't wear this cloth. And so your choice over what you wore was restricted by an external force. Doesn't matter if you say it's for this health reason, your choice, they tried to externalize something over you. They tried to say, no, you will do this or this won't happen. So you, they took away a basic right uh, over what gets to go on your face. I, as a Muslim woman, want the liberty to choose what I can put on. Unlike what France says, you can't wear it. Um, I say, oh, I can if I want, and I don't live in France, right? So liberty to dress the way you want, but then the flip side is they'll say, we want to reveal ourselves. Now we're going to get into some gray area here. You don't got the liberty to do that, but you're going to do what you want. Fine. But in an ideal Sharia law state, we wouldn't have that, but then there would be non-Muslims there who would live there, pay the jizya or whatever, and you wouldn't exactly be able to have a, 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 a clothing uh, enforcement agency. Maybe you could, but kind of like how a school has rules about uniforms and whatnot, you could have something like that, but you have the liberty to wear what colors you want, just can't wear certain symbols and stuff like that so I think you could go find the parameters to judge how you could still have liberty even within a certain context where soft rules are applied. A law of nature, lex naturalis, I like how he has the Latin words there, is a precept or general rule found out by reason by which a man is forbidden to do that which is destructive of his life. So law of nature so it's a precept general rule has reason and you're forbidden to do something which is destructive to your life hmm. or taketh away the means of preserving the same and to omit that by which he thinketh it may be best preserved so how someone thinks that they could best preserve their life for they that speak of the subject use the confound juice and lex right and law yet they ought to be distinguished because right consisteth in liberty to do this is a good point right consists in the liberty to do or to forbear whereas law determines and binds to one of them good point so that law and right differ as much as obligation and liberty which in one and the same manner are inconsistent so obligation obligated to do something, the liberty to not do something. Very interesting. I really like that distinction here. Very helpful. He's such a great writer. Okay. So the law of nature, lex naturalis, sort of a general rule, the reason. Uh, it's by which man can examine what he's forbidden to do, what's destructive to his life, what takes away the means of preserving. Okay, and liberty is something that is absent of external impediments that take away man's power to do what he wills. Um, liberty helps you to not be hindered from using the power left to you according to your judgment and reason. Fascinating. And then the right of nature, he said, was commonly called just natural. And he claims each man has the liberty of that, to use their own power as they see fit, 
to preserve their own nature, to preserve their life, and to use their judgment to do anything that they reason will help you attain the most aptest means to exercise your life in the best way you see fit. Very good uh, section here. And I really enjoy his writing. He teaches us quite a lot. He also pointed out how uh, when there is, where there is no common power, there's no law, and where there's no law, it's going to be quite difficult for you because force and fraud are in war with the, the people. And he argued that justice and injustice are not faculties of the body and mind, but rather they are qualities that relate to when a man is in society, not in solitude. Okay, and then he argued the passions that incline humans towards peace are fear and death. And I really like that because it really makes you think, you know, when did people sue for peace? It's when they're quite tired and whatnot, but don't want to drag out the war. So let me know what you thought. Really enjoy this book, and it's been just a joy to read. If you'd like to join my blog, it's www.subscribestar.com slash Hope to see you there.